And now it's, um, it's my pleasure to announce our very first uh, keynote um, with the title, Why the Fuss About uh, Serverless? Yeah? Because serverless, I would say, isn't just a new technology or a new layer of abstraction we can add to, to the, the web infrastructure uh, we are using. It's really going to change the game fundamentally. And who could be the be a better person than Simon Wardley to explain uh, us what, what impact this can have on software development and on business. Please welcome Simon. Wow. <laughs> what an intro. Thank you, sir. Hello. Um, I'm Simon Wardley. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the whole space of serverless and uh, APIs and, and something called mapping. Any of you heard of mapping? Just a couple. Right. OK. Before I start, Quick word of warning, um, I'm a scientist by training, which means I like graphs. I've done a quick graph. Uh, this is the level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in a 45-minute session. Now, I reckon there's a safe limit of about 60. Uh, being a scientist, I like to experiment, uh, so we'll be using no less than 242. I know what you're probably thinking, uh, what the fiddlesticks is happening here. Uh, can I get out of the room? Just to make it even more exciting, uh, we've actually only got 32 minutes left, so we're really going to go at a pace. So I better show you where we're going to go. I'm going to start off by talking about the issue of strategy uh, within business. After that, we're going to talk about maps and why maps matter for this. Then we're going to talk about patterns, economic patterns within the system, and we're going to use that to explain why APIs matter, after which we'll be able to talk about uh, serverless and why JavaScript will rule the world. So we're going to start with the issue of strategy. Now, for me, this is a long story. It starts back in uh, 2005. I was CEO of a company called Fatango. Uh, online photo service, heavy use of uh, open source technology, provider of open source, sponsors of Perl. Uh, but Fatango had a problem. And the problem with Fatango was the CEO, me. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was making it up as I went along. I wasn't some sort of chess playing master running this company. I was an alchemist, gut fill. It didn't matter. We were profitable. Revenue was growing. We were doing exciting stuff. It's just that I didn't know what I was doing. And of course, I was worried that other people would discover or rumble that I was a fake CEO. Now, we had vision statements. This was the vision statement we wrote in 2003. Our strategy is customer focused. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Sounds all very exciting. The problem with this vision statement is I'd pinched it from another company. <laughs> so in an effort to try and understand what I should have been doing, I started to go around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. I would take a tape recorder and listen to the words that they would use in presentations, and I called the common words business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. Now, I do this every couple of years. Uh, last time was 2014. Uh, these are the common BLAS that people were saying then. Digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage. If I did it today... What sort of words would you expect to hear? AI. It's got to have a bit of AI, yes. Sorry? Blockchain, yes. Everybody's got to have a bit of blockchain. Anyway, so I went around recording these, and I thought, well, OK. I took all these companies' strategy documents and created a blah template. So <laughs> our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort to the market through use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I combined the BLAHs and the BLAH templates and auto-generated 64 strategies at random. <laughs> Things like this. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. 
Number two, our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the month. It's all just gibberish. But I send this around to, to a huge number of people. I've got 400 responses of three basic types. The first was, this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> the second was, I've seen two of these used already. And the third, and my favorite, was, are you for hire? <laughs> So a friend of mine put this all online. This is strategy as a service, by the way. If you, if you ever need a strategy, you just type in the URL, and it will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. Our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market. If you don't like it, it's really simple. Just press refresh. <laughs> So, I, I was thinking, there must be more to it than this. So, I went back and started reading um, Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? The Art of War. So, Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One was understand your purpose, your moral imperative. Second is understand the landscape, the environment you're competing in. Then you need to understand climatic patterns. So these are the things that are impacting the environment. Then you need to understand doctrine. And finally, you get onto the leadership bit. So that's the, the sort of context-specific play. And then I came across John Boyd, a former US Air Force pilot. Anybody know what John Boyd did? Ooda loops. So basically, you have the game. Your first step, the first O of Uda, is to observe the environment. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. Then you need to orientate yourself around this. Finally, you need to decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And it's a loop. I was quite excited by this. I would show other people, and they would say, oh, it doesn't matter. Strategy is all about the importance of why. The problem is there are two whys. There's the why of purpose, as in I want to be the best tea shop in Ashford, and there is the why of movement, as in why do I make this choice over that choice? Best to explain it with a game of chess. Your why of purpose might be to win the game. Your why of movement is do I move that piece or that piece? And it's through moving that we actually learn. So if I move this piece, I gain a positional advantage. If I move this piece, it's checkmate, fool's mate. So we've got a strategy cycle. So I applied that to Fatango. And I thought, right, what's our purpose? Well, we were an online photo service and about 16 different other things as well. So it was all a bit of a mess while I was in charge. So I thought, well, how do we understand the landscape? And that brings me to my next topic, which is maps. So this is all related to something called situational awareness. Any of you with a military background? How important is situational awareness? Hugely. Hugely. Excellent news. Right, right answer. I will pay you later, sir. So to explain situational awareness, I've got three stories. The first one are Vikings. Very frightening people. <laughs> this is how Vikings used to navigate. From Herman, head due west towards Half, and you will have sailed north of Hatland. They used to use stories. So before you got in charge of the boat, you would learn your epic story, which you would use to navigate the boat. Now that means that. So quick question, what would you use to navigate? Visual map or verbal story? Visual map, great. What do we use in business? Verbal story, right. Okay, so the next example is chess world. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, um, but no one's ever seen the board. You play the game very simply. You see these characters on a screen, and you press a button. Pawn. Your opponent sees what you've pressed. They press a button. Pawn. You see what they've pressed. You counter. Pawn. They, see, they counter queen. And the game goes on for ages, until somebody wins, or more likely it's a draw. Now, what will happen is over time, with enough games, we will stick this data into our big data systems and discover magic secrets of success. So if you press queen, I should respond with king, pawn, queen. 
If you don't believe me about secrets of success, there's a wonderful magazine called Harvard Business Review. This is from November 2011. How earlobes can signify leadership potential. It's all about phrenology of management. So, one day, you're going to end up playing a game of chess, and you're going to play a game of chess against somebody who will see something magical. They will see the board. And you will press a button, and they will counter. And you will press a button, and they will counter, and you will have lost. And the first thing you're going to do is go, what the fiddlesticks happened there? Now you're going to write down this sequence as though it's some magic secret of success. What happens when you use it against the player? Do you win? You lose. They adapt. So now you're going, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. So you start recording the speed. How's that going to help you? You lose faster, all right, probably. So now you're going to say it's cultural. Maybe they're a happy sort of person. All right, you lose because you exist in a low-level situational awareness environment. So quick question, what would you use to learn? Secrets of success or context-specific play, as described by a board? Yeah, context-specific play. Right, what do we use in business? Okay, super, right. So the last example is uh, Thermopylae. So the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, uh, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Uh, the Persians were invading. And what he decided to do was block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass known as Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a large force. Now, there are about 4,000 Greeks against about 140 to 170,000, we're not sure, Persians. In that 4,000 Greeks, there were 300 Spartans. Perfect. Right. So I want you to imagine you're part of the Athenian army. I'm the general Themistocles. It's the eve of battle. I'm giving you purpose. We want to defend against the invading Persian hordes. And then I say to you, I do not understand the landscape. I do not understand the environment. I don't have a map. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians. Uh, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian. We actually hate the Spartans. Uh, threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced in a few thousand years. <laughs> okay. So, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Uh, position and movement described by a, a map or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram. Position and movement. Yeah? All right, you know what's coming. What do you think we use in business? <laughs> magic frameworks. Right, so I'm going to go back to chess versus alchemy. If I look at navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess, it's visual navigation, Learning is context-specific. Strategy is all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. Um, if you ask a general, why did you bomb a hill? They won't tell you because I read an article in Generals Weekly that bombing hills was the latest thing. <laughs> or I, uh, I've got this consultancy report saying 67% of other generals are bombing hills. Or I thought it would make a good story. Or that's what Uber would do. I mean, it's all about position and movement. Right. So alchemy is all about storytelling, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. And that's where I was as this fake CEO back in 2005. And I knew the problem was I had no maps. Now, maps have specific characteristics. They are visual. They are context-specific. This is the Battle of Thermopylae, not the Battle of Waterloo. You have an anchor. In this case, it is the compass. You have position of pieces relative to the compass. This is north, south, east, and west of that. You have consistency of movement. Now, I had lots of things that I called maps. I had things like this, systems maps. Anybody seen one of those before? 
Right, so if I take a box here, CRM, Customer Relationship Management, and I move it over there, how's that changed the map? How's it changed the map? Has it, has it changed it at all? No. If I took a map of the world and I shifted Australia and put it next to London, would that change the map of the world? Yes. Right, it doesn't change this map because... It's not a map. Okay, it doesn't have anchor, position, and movement. Because in a map, space has meaning. So I had these maps. Anybody seen one of these before? Business process maps? Yes. They're not maps either. Uh, well, then we had things like digital row maps. Have you ever seen one of these before? Ah, these are brilliant, you know. If I want to go from mobile analytics to A-B testing, I have to go through marketing analytics, social analytics, web content management, tag management, and then I have to get some email. It's just rubbish. Utter gibberish. It's also not a map. So, so that, that one's out. And then, ever seen one of these before? Okay, it's sort of got an anchor, a little bit of position maybe, no movement, it's not a map. It's amazing we keep on using that word in business, but I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. So how to map? That was my problem in 2005. And being a Brit and being totally confused, I sat down and had a cup of tea. <laughs> and while I was having a cup of tea, I realized as a user I need a cup of tea. And a cup of tea has needs. It needs tea. It needs hot water. And hot water has needs. It needs a kettle. It needs cold water. And a kettle has needs. It needs power. So what I've got is an anchor, the user, and position in a chain of needs. So what I can do is I can take my systems diagram, put the user at the top, what they want, online image manipulation, photo storage, website, underline, put the components underneath it in a value chain, so website requires platform, requires compute, data center, and power. And so now I've got an anchor at the top and position. I still don't have movement. And a map without movement is not a map. So how do things move? So I looked at power. Start off with the Parthian battery, about 400 AD. You end up with custom-built systems like Hippolyte Pixie, and then Siemens generators, and then eventually Tesla, um, and Westinghouse, uh, utility provision of electricity, uh, 1886 or 18, well, 1890s, roughly. So power had evolved. And that process of evolution is change, and that is movement. So I spent about six months in the British Library collecting huge numbers of publications and eventually discovered this pattern. If I measure ubiquity versus certainty... So how widespread it is to its commodity market versus how well understood it is, you start off with the genesis of novel and new acts, custom-built examples, products, rental services, eventually whatever it is becomes a commodity and you get utility services if suitable. And this is driven by supply and demand competition. Now that is movement. So I was able to take my value chain, flatten that evolution curve at the bottom, Genesis custom-built product commodity, and simply put things where they were. And that was in 2005, and that was the first map I produced. And what I've got now is anchor, position, and movement. And I was excited. And I showed this to others, and they went, so what? <laughs> okay, so what? Well, that brings us to patterns. Because if you can observe the landscape, you can now start to observe climactic patterns. So these are the rules of the game. These are the patterns that change the environment, regardless of what you do. And there's about 30 of them. The simplest one is everything evolves. If there is supply and demand competition, everything will move from the left-hand side, eventually to the right-hand side. It doesn't matter whether it's computing, money, or penicillin. The second thing is that as things evolve, their characteristics change. They start off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, um, and they evolve through another set of characteristics until eventually they become more industrialized, ordered, stable, standard, dull, boring. Now, this was a big thing for me because in 
I think it was about 2001, 2000, well, 2001 roughly, we'd adopted extreme programming throughout the organisation. Actually, it was probably about 2000. The problem was by about 2002, 2003 roughly, we started to realise it didn't work everywhere. And of course it's not going to work everywhere if your organisation has many components evolving and their characteristics are changing. So what we learned was that agile extreme programming very strong on the, in the uncharted space because it's good at reducing the cost of change. But it sucks compared to something like Six Sigma on the right-hand side, which is good at reducing deviation, which is what you want to do. And both of them aren't much cop compared to something like Lean, which is strong in the middle, which is focused on learning and reducing waste. So what we learned was there was no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods. We also discovered that as things evolve, we had inertia because of past success. And the classic example of this is Blockbuster Netflix. Who was the first with a website? Blockbuster, right. Who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, great. Who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, perfect. Right, who went bankrupt first? <laughs> OK? The point about this is you can't say... You know, uh, oh, you don't want to be a dinosaur like Blockbuster. They, they out-innovated everyone. The problem was their business model. Late fees. They made money from people forgetting to bring their videos back to the store. That's what created inertia for them. Now, the point about this is now I can do some basic prediction. I've shown you a few simple patterns. Um, we have 30. So I've got a map. And what we knew back in 2005 was that compute and platform would end up going to a utility. We knew we'd have inertia to the change, and we knew another pattern called componentization, that this would enable an explosion of higher-order systems with new sources of value and worth. And that mattered to me because that told me where I could invest. Do I want to invest in our existing service? or build the world's first computer as a service, or platform as a service, or wait until somebody else does that and build on top of them. The next set of patterns that you learn are doctrine, and there's 40 of those. These are the universally applicable principles regardless of context. So these are the ones you have choice over, but you should use them all the time anyway. So I'll give you an example. The Emergency Services Mobile Communication Platform. A big government project. There, there they are, you know, 600-page specification document, sitting in the meeting and say, what's the user need? To which everybody looks at each other and then points it must be somewhere in the document. So the first thing is I got a group of them to map it out. So one of the beauties about maps is the anchor is the user. So you have to start by focusing on the user needs. This might be a bit of a shock to people, but it turns out that's a universally useful thing to do. Now, once you've done that, you need to understand all the other components that are involved in making such a system. And it turns out it's actually useful, universally useful, to think small, as in know the details. Now, once you've done that and you've got a map, you can share it with others. So you've got borders, police, immigration. You share the maps. You just start discovering the same components are being built in different places. Now, I thought government had a problem with duplication because we had 120 workflow systems doing exactly the same thing in one department. Government doesn't have a problem with duplication. It is minuscule compared to the nonsense that goes on in the private sector. I've got a pharma company, 350 teams, building enterprise content management systems. I see uh, they had a global architects meeting. One of the global architects goes, don't worry, we're building the global enterprise content management system. To which another architect, two seconds later, goes, hang on, we're building that. Five separate efforts to build the global enterprise content management system in a sea of 350. I've got a bank 
with approximately a thousand risk management systems doing the same thing. They complain they can't innovate. So the next thing you learn is to remove duplication. Then you learn to think small, i.e. things like microservices. Break it down into small components, but also contracts. And the reason for this is also because you can't apply one-size-fits-all methods. On the left-hand side, you want to use agile techniques, extreme programming. Once you get in the middle, you now have an idea of where you're going, so MVP, much more lean agile. You might start using things like Kanban, etc. By the time you get to the right-hand side, you know what you want. It's already industrialized. It's defined. Specification is a good thing. So you use appropriate methods. So to give you an example of this, um, do you know what a, a world perception server is? Anybody here? No? Okay, it's part of a self-driving car. Right, I'm going to pretend you're all from finance, which basically means uh, probably a lot of IT is a bit elvish to you. So what I've done is I've taken a systems diagram and translated it into elvish. So uh, there's out there, this is what we're building. All right, now you're in finance, so I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, do you think we should outsource or build our own? Do you think we should outsource or build our own? What do you think? It's cheaper. Is it? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> right. You just don't have a clue, do you? <laughs> no. But it's all right. You're going to give me an answer because that's what people do. Right. This is exactly the same diagram in mapping format. Should we outsource or build our own? What do you think? Yeah. Should we outsource or build our own? It becomes a bit obvious then, doesn't it? Okay. And if I turn it back into English, there you are, GPS over there, World Perception Server over here. So you learn to use appropriate methods. Uh, then you learn to think small, as in small teams. Then you learn to think about aptitude and attitude, because it turns out the culture you need here is different from here, is different from here. And that's a system called Pioneers, Settlers, Town Planners. And you can read more about that in something called Boiling Frogs. Uh, that's GCHQ, they've open sourced this. Uh, it's a wonderful document. Get a chance, look it up online, read it. So now, we understand our purpose, landscape, climate, so we're using that for anticipation. We're learning about doctrine. We now finally get to gameplay. Where can I attack and how can I manipulate the market? So this is all about context-specific forms of gameplay. So you've got a map. We anticipate where it's going. We know we can invest in multiple different places. You then learn we can manipulate the market. You can use open approaches to accelerate things to more of a commodity. You can slow it down with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You can use constraints. There's about 70 different ways of manipulating a market. So that's what we did in 2005. We used it to develop a service, which we called Zimki, which we then launched. Now, Zimki was a, a platform as a service, or what we now call serverless. It had functional billing. You built entire applications in JavaScript, front and back end. Um, got rid of all the translation problems from the front to the back end because we used a single language. And it, the functional billing changed practices as well. And so that, that's what we did. We acted, we launched, and there we are, Zimki, uh, 2000, and this was in 2007, April. And people were building entire applications front and back end in JavaScript. It was wonderful. Um, and we were growing like hotcakes. Does anybody remember Zimki? Well, one of the developers is actually here. And it's good to see you, by the way. It's been a long, long time. So it was fabulous. Unfortunately, a parent company had one of those strashy consultancy US firms come in and basically say the things that we were doing, like this cloud stuff, 3D printing, mobile phones, cameras, was not the future uh, because they'd looked into their crystal ball in 2006 and seen that the future was 3D television. So we should shut it all down and spend a billion on 3D TV. Uh, does anybody own a 3D TV? Right, anybody use a 3D TV? <laughs> okay, so, so unfortunately that's what happened. So then I went to Canonical. Um, uh, anybody heard of Ubuntu? Well, fantastic. Right, so we had a map, 
Uh, we mapped it out in 2008. We used the map to attack the space. We were 2% of the operating system market. Half a million later, 18 months later, it was 70% of all cloud. Great fun. And then I started doing stuff with government. So now we've gone through strategy, maps, patterns, and we want to go on to APIs. I've got this funny little diagram symbol here. What does that mean? Part of the Zimke play was a, a, a particular ecosystem approach, which we wrote about. It's very simple. What you do is you find a product and you turn it into a utility service. You industrialize it, expose it through an API. And what you hope by making it public is that other people build on top. Because what you're going to do is those people will build all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So if you all build on top of my service, and say 99% of you do kit and internet, which goes nowhere, and one or two of you do big data, I will know from the metadata, I, from the consumption of my service, I can spot there's something interesting over here. So I can then commoditize that to a new component service, and people will build on top of that. And this is a very simple game. You get everybody else to innovate for you, you leverage the metadata to spot future patterns. You commoditize it to new component services. Now, normally, um, this model known as ILC, we draw it in a circular pattern. So there you are in the middle, the supplier. This is your ecosystem. You're mining metadata. People are building on top. You're giving them services they want. And the point about this is your rate of innovation, customer focus, and efficiency all now increase with the size of the ecosystem. The more people building on top, the faster you seem to be innovating, because they're your free research and development department. They are better your customer focus, because you're mining metadata to find what people want, and of course you get economies of scale. Now, of course, what will happen is every time you industrialize, somebody will grumble, oh, he's eating my business model. Anybody know a company which seems to be accelerating in terms of efficiency, customer focus, and innovation, and people grumble about them eating their business model? Uber, not no, uh, uh, Uber, Amazon, okay? So anybody thinking Amazon is tough today, you've got it easy today compared to five years from now, all right? I'm very good at mining and going up the value chain. They're brilliant at it. Now, a quick warning about this. This game is very useful if you play build APIs around industrialized components. You cannot do this trying to build APIs around the novel and new because the APIs are not stable, constantly changing. It actually has a very, very negative impact. So building APIs and ecosystem plays is context specific. You play them on this side of the board. Right, lastly, serverless. To explain serverless, I'm gonna have to give you a history of computing. We start off in the early days with computing where applications are built into compute, i.e. into the hardware itself. What happened is this started to evolve, and we got custom-built examples, like Lion's Electronic Office. So now we got applications, and we built something called an operating system, which worked on custom-built compute, and that was quite exciting. And these continued to evolve until we got products like the IBM 650. So now we've got applications built on operating systems, built on a product, which had a characteristic called high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So what that meant is when my server went bang, it would take me weeks, if not months, to get a new one. So what we did is we built novel architectural practices to cope with this. We did things like M plus one, scale up capacity planning, because you didn't want to run out of space and had to wait for months for the new server. We did disaster recovery tests. Anybody remember those? Okay. And all of this stuff evolved. Then we got the first language frameworks. Uh, applications, frameworks, operating systems, good architectural practice built on products, computers as a product. And we started to get emerging coding practices. And of course, all of this stuff started to evolve. And so it ended up looking like this. Applications were built on best coding practice, on a product-based uh, framework, .NET, whatever it happened to be. Operating systems, best architectural practices for compute as a product. And the world was happy. And then cloud happened. 
And cloud is simply that. That is the entire history of cloud. It is just a shift of compute from product to utility. Nothing more. But that has a profound effect. Suddenly, we go from a high MTTR to a low MTTR environment. Suddenly, if my machine goes bang, it doesn't take me months. It takes me seconds to get a new one. So no longer do I do M plus one disaster recovery tests. Now I distribute systems. I do design for failure. I do chaos engines. Suddenly, I can deploy more quickly. Continuous deployment. I'm not sitting waiting for the servers to turn up. So we got novel architectural practices, and CEOs got very excited by this cloud stuff. Somebody wrote articles about how cloud, not earlobes, not 3D TV, could lead to leadership potential. And so they would go, make my stuff cloudy. Do you remember that? And people would take their stuff and stick it on Amazon. Amazon would have an outage. And people would go, the end of cloud is nigh. <laughs> to which you'd go, shouldn't that architecture evolve as well? And they'd go, burn him, heretic. How's that? Oh, blimey. Right, super. So it's all about user needs, iterative cycles, automation, DevOps. It's really exciting. But then you'd say that to people, and they'd go, so was I till. And they'd go, burn him heretic. <laughs> anyway, so what happened is operating systems have now industrialized. And now we've got this going on with frameworks. This is what Lambda and serverless is all about. And you're seeing a co-evolution of practice. A new practice is forming. We're combining development with finance. Functional billing is a huge deal. Suddenly, I know, you know how much my code is actually costing me. Refactoring changes. I'm now looking at what are the bits of code that are costing me the most. The practices, my ways of operating, monitoring this stuff has changed. And that is developing and evolving. And that's where you should be focused. Lambda and these new architectural practices around it, which we don't even have a name for it at the moment. That's why somebody's just called it Jeff. And Amazon is doing the usual game. Ecosystem moving up the value chain, and a new tribe is forming. But the best thing about this is all the stuff which is now the new legacy, which includes DevOps. But you go to a conference and you say DevOps is the new legacy, they will go, burn him, heretic. <laughs> they always do. So recap very quickly, strategy, there's a cycle. It's important to act, but as you go around this cycle, it's also important to learn. In order to learn, you have to understand the landscape, which means you need a map. Maps are very simple. All you need is an anchor, such as the user, position, and movement. And now you can learn. Once you start learning, you start using more context-specific forms of gameplay. You start being able to anticipate through common economic patterns. You learn how to build and exploit ecosystems. You learn that serverless is not a big frightening thing, but it is the way we are going. And this is where we should be focused. Languages like JavaScript running on the framework of Lambda and the new practices that will evolve in that space. They'll be the billion dollar two person company that produces nothing but a function that everybody else uses. And Amazon is moving up the stack and playing its normal games. A new tribe is forming and of course, there is the past. Of course, when you say this to the past, they will always tell you, burn him, heretic. They always have inertia. Ask Blockbuster. So we've done strategy, maps, patterns, APIs, and serverless. 
I've kept it as close as I could to 40 minutes. I'm now eating into your coffee break, so I'm now going to say thank you, and uh, you've been a pleasure. <laughs> oh, hang on. One last thing. I was also going to say, hang on a second. We, um, th all of this mapping stuff, by the way, is Creative Commons. Can we pop the slides up? Oh, you star. All of this stuff is Creative Commons, so please help yourself. I mean, mapping is something that you have to learn. Uh, no one's going to come and do your maps for you. Uh, there's about 600 pages. It's pretty simple stuff. Just uh, go through it. It just takes a bit of time and practice. It's a bit like chess. Um, we also have a map camp going on, so a community event in uh, October, which we'll be announcing. Um, so if you want to come and meet some mappers from government and other places, come along. You'll be more than welcome. Sorry about that, and thank you very much. Thank you.